When Andy's parents confronted him and insisted that he request a DNA test from his fiancée, he was left bewildered and angered by their suspicions. What he soon discovered was something completely unexpected. Andy had departed his hometown to attend a prestigious college in the city, where he pursued a degree in theology with aspirations of becoming a pastor. In his classes, he encountered a young woman named Jessica, with whom he quickly fell in love. The two attended church together and organized prayer meetings on campus. Interestingly, Jessica hailed from the same small town as Andy, but their paths had never crossed before, a fact that struck them as odd given the town's size. Ronald, Andy's father, had always advised him not to delay when time was of the essence, without elaborating further. Taking his father's words to heart, Andy, unable to ignore his feelings for Jessica, decided to seize the moment. After church on a Sunday, he took Jessica for a walk in the campus gardens, where he knelt down and proposed, expressing his desire not to waste another moment without her. Convinced that the Lord had brought them together for a reason, he asked Jessica to marry him, and through tears, she said yes. Following their engagement, Andy and Jessica, in front of the setting sun, embraced each other and said a prayer. Excitement filled them as they looked forward to returning to their hometown after the semester. Andy was eager to introduce Jessica to his family, being a devoted family man. During this time, Andy learned that Jessica had always felt lost, and he went out of his way to ensure she felt welcomed. Unfortunately, neither of them could have anticipated the challenges that lay ahead. Andy called his father to organize a barbecue and invite the entire family, planning a pseudo-engagement party to introduce Jessica to his relatives for the first time. Upon their arrival, Andy and Jessica were met by his parents, Ronald and his mother. Carrie stepped forward to greet them, Mom, Dad, I'd like to introduce you to my fiancé, Jessica, Andy said, gesturing towards his soon-to-be wife. The expressions on both Ronald and Carrie's faces were undeniable, they seemed as if they had seen a ghost. Ronald cautiously offered Jessica a hug, his face turning noticeably pale. I'm sorry, Jessica. It's so nice to meet you, he said, his words almost trembling as they left his mouth. Carrie also appeared uneasy when she hugged Jessica, and the couple sensed that something was amiss. By any chance, is your mother's name Rose? Ronald asked Jessica with an inquisitive look on his face, observing the interaction with growing discomfort. No, um, my mom's name is Ashley, Jessica responded, looking toward Andy for assistance. Hey, Dad, why don't we get her settled in and introduce her to everybody, shall we? Andy suggested, attempting to break the strange tension. As the brief break ensued, Andy and Jessica were hoping to plan a small wedding ceremony before the next semester began. While Jessica sat inside making wedding preparations, Carrie pulled Andy into the kitchen for a private conversation. Jessica couldn't shake the feeling of being watched since her introduction to the family, sensing that she was at the center of some unsettling gossip. Listen, Andy, I'm not sure if you noticed, but your dad and I were kind of surprised when we met Jessica, Carrie told him in a half whisper. Oh, really, mom? A blind man could have seen how awkward you and dad were acting, Andy remarked. Well, some things are really awkward. Listen to me closely, Andy. We have to do a DNA test on Jessica. She's a mirror image of dad's ex-girlfriend, Rose. It's uncanny, Carrie said, looking around nervously. Oh, geez, mom, is that why dad was asking about her mom? Like Jessica said, her mom's name is Ashley. Nobody in her family's ever heard of us, and vice versa. You guys are being really weird about this. Let it go, Andy, he urged. Later, Andy went to talk to Jessica about his conversation with his mother. Jessica was clearly stressed about the seating arrangements, habitually pulling out her hair when nervous. First of all, I think it's kind of cute that I have a doppelganger. At least it explains why I feel like I've been watched all the time. But it's just a rumor, it'll pass, my love. More importantly, how can I plan this whole thing in such a short time? Jessica replied. Even if you arrange it perfectly, people will probably end up sitting where they want to sit. 
Let's go for a walk to unwind, Andy suggested. After Jessica and Andy left the house to stroll through the yard, Carrie sneaked into the room to take one of Jessica's loose hair strands from the table. Two weeks later, the wedding day was about to commence, and both Andy and Jessica were beyond nervous. Andy wore his late grandfather's suit, while Jessica donned her grandmother's old wedding dress. Both waited patiently for the ceremony to begin. Meanwhile, Ronald and Carrie had just received a letter in the mail. They opened it and read slowly, twice over. Afterward, they looked at each other with grim expressions. I knew it, Ronald exclaimed. What are you waiting for? Go and show Andy. Hurry. Carrie shouted. Ronald found his son adjusting his suit in the men's changing rooms in the church and turned to see his dad out of breath. You okay, dad? Andy asked. I'm really sorry, son. I wish there was another way we could have figured this all out, Ronald replied as he handed Andy the envelope, leaving him confused. Andy read through the letter, and a look of despair washed over his face. Without a second thought, he rushed to Jessica's changing room, prompting Ronald to call Carrie to join them in following Andy. When Andy arrived, Jessica noticed his flustered state. Andy, what's wrong? You shouldn't be back here, you know it's bad luck to see the bride in her wedding dress, Jessica said. Andy blurted out, Annie, they were right. Everyone was right. Your mom, Ashley, is not your real mom. Calm down, Andy. You sound crazy. We've already spoken about this. Everybody's making up rumors because I look like your dad's ex-girlfriend from decades ago. Big whoop, Jessica responded. Just look, Andy said as he handed Jessica the envelope. My mom secretly got a test done, somehow, even though I told her not to, and despite my disagreement, she did it anyway. I'm still trying to figure this all out, but this test confirms one thing for sure, Jessica. Ronald is your dad. You're my sister. Jessica sat down slowly as her hands began to tremble. She couldn't believe what she was reading, it felt like her entire world was crashing down. Immediately, she called her parents, who were waiting in the church hall for the ceremony to start. Hi, Angel. You're not getting cold feet, are you? Should I come to the changing room? Ashley asked. Are you and Dad my real parents? Jessica asked immediately. What do you mean? Ashley responded, scurrying out of the church hall. Are you and Dad my birth parents? Did you give birth to me? Jessica reiterated. Ashley hesitated, clutching her purse tighter before taking a long breath and replying. No, Jessica, you were adopted. You were left at the door of an orphanage, and your father and I thought that since we couldn't find any information about your real parents, we just raise you as our own. It wouldn't matter. Please forgive us, Angel, Ashley replied, her voice filled with remorse. Jessica dropped the call, and Ronald and Carrie slowly entered her changing room. Andy sat next to Jessica and held her hand, but for the first time since they met, uncertainty and shock hung heavily in the air. There was no intimacy years ago. I dated a woman named Rose. We were planning on getting married and starting a family, but one day, out of the blue, Rose vanished without a trace. She was just gone. We reported her missing and looked everywhere for her, but we couldn't find her. Everyone in the family knew Rose, Andy, your mother, was Rose's best friend. That's how he met. I ended up falling for your mother, and Rose became something of a memory. We always wondered about her and whether she'd ever come back. And then, three weeks ago, you brought home Jessica. It was as if you brought Rose home. Jessica's not just a doppelganger, it was as if you cloned Rose. We didn't know what to do, but we knew something was amiss. So your mom got sneaky and did a DNA test. We had to know. I'm sorry it ended up like this, kids. You guys go out and talk, I'll talk to the family, Ronald told Andy and Jessica. Andy and Jessica left through the back door without saying a word to catch their breath and take a stroll before facing the family. 
Ronald and Carrie went to the church hall to inform the guests that the wedding was cancelled in light of the new information. Everybody was stunned to learn that the rumors were true. Ronald and Carrie also comforted Ashley and her husband Jacob, who were both riddled with guilt for keeping the truth from Jessica for so long. As Andy and Jessica walked through the garden together, neither knew exactly what to say to the other. So I know things are bizarre right now, but there's a bright side to it, Andy said. Yeah, I think I know what you're gonna say, Jessica replied. You're right. All those years, you weren't crazy. You had a whole family that you didn't know about, and they were in the same town as you this whole time. So let's ignore the awkward stuff and focus on that. Welcome to the family, Jessica. I promise they're much less weird when they haven't seen a ghost, Andy responded. Thanks, bro, Jessica replied awkwardly. Yeah, that's gonna take some getting used to, Andy retorted. The two returned to the church changing rooms and got changed. As they walked into the church hall, their family waited to welcome Jessica with open arms. Everyone was glad to have Jessica with them, and she was happy to have found a new family, albeit in a different way than expected. Let's continue. That morning, Mrs. Whitaker's heart sank as she returned from the school playground. Jamie, her pupil, had unexpectedly opened up about his family. Although Mrs. Whitaker understood the boundaries between a teacher and a student's personal life, Jamie was an exception. At only seven years old, he stood out as the sweetest and kindest boy in her class. Despite his young age, he had never been in trouble, always maintaining a quiet demeanor. Seeing Jamie with a Polaroid camera that day, Mrs. Whitaker decided to have a gentle conversation with him. Little did she know that this talk would unveil a heartbreaking truth that would alter their lives forever. That's a lovely camera you've got there, darling, Mrs. Whitaker remarked. The young boy turned to face her and quietly replied, thank you. Daddy got it for me. As the conversation continued, Mrs. Whitaker expressed her admiration for the camera and inquired about the photos Jamie might have taken. He shook his head, replying, not yet but I know I'll get some pretty clicks. Daddy was a photographer, and he loved taking pictures. Mrs. Whitaker, with a smile, shared a bit about her own father, a literature professor, and his talents in explaining Shakespeare and Dante. However, her attempt to connect took an unexpected turn when she noticed Jamie's eyes welling up. Can't get me anything now, he whispered. Daddy's gone. He went to the angels. Upon hearing this, Mrs. Whitaker felt something pass through her heart, making her stomach churn. She regretted asking Jamie about his father, realizing that, since she began teaching him, she had always wondered why the boy never spoke about his family. She had glimpsed Jamie's mother once during a parent-teacher meeting, but the opportunity to inquire about Jamie's happiness at home never presented itself. After learning about his father's passing, Mrs. Whitaker's heart sank. You're a brave boy, Jamie, she told him calmly. I'm sure your father is telling the angels what a beautiful son he has. Isn't that right? Blood is not always thicker than water. Mrs. Whitaker noticed a peculiar sadness in Jamie's eyes as he nodded and returned to class. That morning, she stood watching him leave, pondering the magnitude of the loss for a young heart like Jamie's. Unbeknownst to her, Jamie was so devastated after losing his father that he couldn't bring himself to part with his camera. He carried it everywhere, even skipping classes occasionally to capture landscapes and nature. A day came when Jamie didn't show up at school, and Mrs. Whitaker couldn't reach his mother. Initially assuming he was sick and would return soon, days passed without any communication about Jamie. Concerned, Mrs. Whitaker attempted to contact his mother, but all calls went unanswered. Despite initial thoughts that she might be overthinking, a gut feeling urged her that something wasn't right. After the lessons, Mrs. Whitaker, fueled by worry, grabbed her purse, searched the school records for Jamie's address, and decided to drive to his house. Arriving, she found herself on the front porch of a decent but neglected house. The lawn urgently needed mowing, and fence pickets were missing. Mrs. Whitaker rang the doorbell, glancing around. When there was no answer, she rang again, growing more concerned. 
As the door finally opened, Mrs. Whitaker was shocked to find Jamie standing in the doorway, a little baby in his arms. Oh dear, Jamie, are there no elders at home? Mrs. Whitaker asked with evident concern. Jamie's shoulders slumped, and he admitted glumly, We're all right, Mrs. Whitaker. You could come later, Granny is not home. Kneeling to face Jamie, Mrs. Whitaker inquired, Where's your mother, darling? She noticed his eyes welling up as he replied, She isn't home. Deciding to take matters into her own hands, Mrs. Whitaker declared, I'm coming in to look after you until she returns. Stepping into the house, she was met with shock. Half-buttered bread lay on the kitchen counter, toys were scattered in the living room, and dirty milk bottles were on the front table, accompanied by a pram beside the couch. The state of the house suggested neglect, and Mrs. Whitaker slowly began to understand why Jamie had been absent from school for days. Would you kindly hold my sister, Camilla, Mrs. Whitaker? I can make you some tea, and I'm hungry. I need to make sandwiches, Jamie requested. Mrs. Whitaker, not in the mood for tea, replied, I suppose I can make you a sandwich instead. But you really need to tell me whether someone is watching out for you and your sister. This house appears to be in disarray, and your mother should be thankful no one called the cops on her, she exclaimed. So, you sit right there on the couch and leave things up to me. Mrs. Whitaker busied herself, buttering bread and making juice from the oranges in the fruit basket. She handed Jamie a large glass of juice and a sandwich, rocking Camilla while he ate. Suddenly, Jamie spoke up, Granny will be home soon. Thank you. Mrs. Whitaker replied, well, all right, as she looked around the house. In a room beside the kitchen, she noticed photographs on the walls. One photo caught her eye, Camilla's Polaroid. Unable to resist, she asked Jamie about it. Are those your baby sister's pictures in that room? Jamie nodded. I take them to track her growth, Daddy did that too when I was little. Oh, how sweet. That's lovely, Jamie, Mrs. Whitaker said as she sat beside him. Curiosity prompted her to ask, so, is your mother away? I mean, you said your granny was looking after you. Jamie shook his head. She is, he paused and Mrs. Whitaker inquired, she is what? Before Jamie could finish, the doorbell cut Mrs. Whitaker off. Opening the door, she saw a fragile woman who resembled Jamie on the front porch. Are you Jamie's grandmother? She asked, and the older woman nodded. I'm sorry for just walking into your house like this, but Jamie didn't show up at school for days, and I was worried. I'm his teacher. Please, please come in. Jamie's grandmother, Rose, invited. As she walked in, her eyes welled up, and she cried, Oh, God! What has this house become? Mrs. Whitaker made some tea for Rose, who then explained why Jamie had been absent from school. A week ago, Jamie's mother, Stella, was on her way home from a party when her speeding car toppled, resulting in her death. The news shocked Rose, who suffered a stroke and was taken to the hospital. Rose's friend handled Stella's funeral arrangements but couldn't stay back to look after Jamie and Camilla due to her own responsibilities. Rose revealed that Stella was not a good mother and had affairs with men much younger and older than her. Camilla's father remained unknown, as Stella never wanted her but couldn't terminate the pregnancy due to complications. Rose admitted, it must have been one of those men who was Camilla's father. Stella never wanted Camilla but couldn't terminate the pregnancy because of complications. The moment she birthed Camilla. Rose continued, she felt like she was free, she dumped her children on me and returned to her old life, partying and spending nights with men. I felt terrible for my grandkids, and I couldn't bear the thought of them ending up in foster care. So, I took matters into my hands and started looking after them. Stella was a part of me, she was my flesh and blood, Rose said sadly. She was a mother, and so, my darling, the thought of losing your child breaks you from within. I was on the phone with this officer, and he told me my daughter was just not coming back. Oh, how that tore me apart. Mrs. 
Whitaker placed her hand over Rose's and shared about her own heart-wrenching loss. I get it, she said. I do. My husband and I lost our son two years ago, and things have never been the same ever since. Oh, it just doesn't stay the same, Rose remarked. All that remains is regret and a sliver of hope that things might change. Well, I may not have been in your shoes, Rose, but I understand what you're going through, Mrs. Whitaker empathized. My husband and I tried for a child after losing our darling boy, but it wasn't in God's plan. We went through all sorts of fertility treatments and sought advice from the best experts, but sometimes it's just not in your stars. Listen, I'd be delighted to help you too in any way I can, she offered. Jamie has been a wonderful child, and I can't see him missing out on his childhood. That little child has been through a lot, Rose admitted, looking at Jamie, who was eating at the kitchen table. I spoke to him when I was in the hospital, and that child, he cried and told me he wanted me home. I was only discharged today, and you see, he's been watching after Camilla. I know he's doing things that a seven-year-old wouldn't do, but he never had a choice. I continually taught him things that school didn't, since his life was so different from the other children. Stella's absence left a void in his life, compounded by the long departure of his father. Though I was present, my frequent bouts of illness hindered my ability to assist my grandson adequately. In a hopeful turn of events, Mrs. Whitaker suggested a positive change. Let's alter that she exclaimed with encouragement. I'd be delighted to support this sweet little family, especially Jamie. Reflecting on Jamie's challenging circumstances, Mrs. Whitaker found it hard to envision a more difficult life. As she drove home that day, she shared everything with her husband, who was shocked to learn that Jamie, a young boy, was caring for his sister alone. The compassionate couple resolved to extend their assistance to Jamie's family. While Mrs. Whitaker supported Rose in caring for Jamie and Camilla, Mr. Whitaker organized exciting picnics, hikes, sightseeing trips, and more for the family. Within months, the Whitakers became the family Jamie and Camilla had never had. The turning point came on Mrs. Whitaker's birthday when Jamie presented her with a photo album featuring snapshots taken during their outings. The images captured moments of pure joy, laughter, and shared experiences. Mrs. Whitaker was moved to tears upon discovering a heartfelt message behind one of the Polaroids. The note read, Camilla, me, and Mrs. Whitaker, she's like our new mommy. This revelation felt like a divine sign to Mrs. Whitaker, realizing that her connection with Jamie might have been part of God's plan all along. Prompted by this realization, Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker had a serious discussion and decided to adopt Jamie and Camilla. Nervously, they presented the idea to Rose, who responded by bursting into tears and gently pressing the Whitaker's palms in her hands. I've always wondered what would happen to my beautiful grandbabies if God called me home, Rose confessed. Oh dear, I fought with God sometimes, begging for answers. I think I won today. I couldn't have asked him for more, my grandbabies would be safe with you. That's all I want. Years later, Rose passed away, and by then, the Whitakers had already adopted Jamie and Camilla. As Jamie grew up, he chose to follow in his late father's footsteps and became a renowned photographer. His skillful lens captured magical shots, including poignant moments of Mrs. Whitaker cradling Camilla and images of Camilla's tiny feet evolving over time. These photographs earned him praise and recognition beyond what he could have ever dreamed of. Dina's husband tired of traditions, had just left work and headed straight to the supermarket. Remembering their fourth wedding anniversary that day, she decided to surprise him. She planned to cook him a delicious dinner, share a cake, and of course, enjoy a bottle of fine wine. This was despite the fact that just five months ago, her husband had left her for another woman, which wasn't the first time. In the past year, he had left her at least three times. However, he always returned home after two months, proclaiming Dina as the only woman in his life, begging on his knees for forgiveness, tears streaming down his face. He pleaded for another chance, promising never to leave her again, especially not for another woman. The third time he left with another woman, 
He didn't return for a long four months. Dina thought he wouldn't come back. But that wasn't the case. After four months and two weeks, he returned with flowers and chocolates. Instead of anger, Dina embraced him tightly. Darling, she said to the man, who replied, I'm back, and I swear I'll never leave you again. No woman compares to you. As usual, Dina believed his words and took him back. Now, she was home to celebrate their wedding anniversary, deciding to forget all the unpleasantness and start anew. Despite friends and family advising her to leave this unfaithful and troublesome man, Dina wouldn't listen. I love him. And he loves me. Our love is strong and can overcome anything in life. She said. So. The woman began preparing for a delightful dinner. After getting everything ready. She decided to dress up. Taking a bath. Wearing an elegant and slightly provocative dress. Spraying perfume. And waiting. Her husband was only a few minutes from home. But time passed. And he didn't show up. An hour. Then two hours went by. Disappointed. Dina opened a bottle of wine and started drinking alone. With her last sip. She raised her hand. Toasting to her luck. Thinking. You'll come back. Drunk. She heard the door open around 5 a.m. the next day. Followed by snoring from the living room. Apparently. Her husband had returned and fallen asleep on the couch. Clutching her pillow. Dina cried and cried. Upset by the turn of events on such a special day and disheartened by her husband's forgetfulness of their anniversary. She was further hurt by his lack of consideration. Questioning. Does he really love me? Upon waking up. Dina saw her husband sleeping on the sofa. However. Something caught her attention. Tie-in. There were stains on his white shirt that looked like lipstick. Dina could hardly believe it. For her. It was a heavy blow. Realizing that her husband was still the unfaithful person she thought he might never change. Moreover. She detected a strong scent of women's perfume. So. She woke him up, Heathina. Let me sleep a bit longer. When he opened his eyes. He said. Why do you smell like women's perfume? And is that lipstick on your shirt? His wife asked. What are you talking about? I'm not here to listen to your accusations. Dina. I had a busy day at work yesterday. Working late. Please respect my sleep. And then the man fell back asleep. The woman was truly furious. It seemed like she was awakened to reality. She grabbed some trash bags. Went to their bedroom. Started packing some of the man's clothes. And then returned to the living room. She woke him up again. Let's get up. Grab your clothes now. You need to leave my home immediately. How could you? It was our anniversary yesterday. And you were fooling around with another woman. Who do you think you are? I've forgiven you many times before. But this is it. Go away. My mom was right. You're a bad man. A big cheating turnip that will never change. Who knows who you're with. And then you come to touch me, no more. Go away. Live your life. Let me live mine. I don't want to suffer for you anymore. Fine. Fine. I'm leaving. You know. I have plenty of places to go. And someone will embrace me with love. Oh. By the way. Remember that you're the one asking me to leave. Goodbye. And just like that. The man picked up all his belongings and left. Dina listened to the sound of the door closing. Crying like she had never cried in her life. But she swore this would be the last time she let a man make her suffer. Since then. Over half a year passed. And the man still hadn't reappeared. The woman felt deeply saddened. But she realized it was the right course of action. Even considering expediting the divorce process. As too much time had already been wasted. However. She needed some money to hire a lawyer. Fortunately. Now her happiness was the top priority. She tried to cope with the situation every day. Accepting everything that had happened. It wasn't easy. But she had no other choice. She was still young and couldn't immerse herself in depression and loneliness. One day. As she walked down the street. An impulse led her to glance through the window of a restaurant. At one of the tables. She saw the man who ha. D caused her so much pain. Enjoying a delightful candlelit dinner with another woman. They looked very happy. 
She had never seen him like that before. He genuinely seemed content. The other woman was very attractive. Dressed elegantly. Much younger than him. With well-kept hair. Makeup. And a graceful figure. Dina didn't want to continue watching and decided to move on with her life. When she got home, she resolved to renovate everything completely, leaving the past entirely behind. This meant getting rid of anything that would remind her of him. So, she grabbed some bags and threw everything in, including the watch he gave her, video games, and things he bought with her money, such as clothes and tools. She wanted to rid herself of everything associated with him. However, she didn't know whom to give these things to. She didn't want to give them to neighbors, friends, or family because she felt ashamed of everything she had been through. So, she placed these items in a designated spot until she found the right person. At least now, everything that reminded her of the man who hurt her was no longer visible. One day, after work, Dina noticed a homeless man nearby who seemed lost. She felt sympathy since she rarely saw homeless people where she worked. She approached and gave him some coins. The man looked up. And Dina realized he was just a young person. She gave him some money. And he gratefully accepted. Then she walked away. Pondering how someone could end up in such a situation. She felt grateful to have a home. A place to sleep. And live. She thought about giving him some of her husband's leftover clothes. However. Dina didn't see him again until three weeks later. On her way home through the park, she noticed him sitting on a bench and recognized him by the bag he was holding. Hello. Dina said. The homeless man looked up, appearing confused. Do you remember me? I gave you some money a few days ago. She reminded him. The homeless man barely spoke. Have you eaten today? She asked. He shook his head. Then. She asked him to wait went to a nearby restaurant, bought some food, and brought it back to him. The man was almost in disbelief. She sat next to him, watching him eat so desperately, and felt very sad. So she asked, I'm sorry, but how did you end up here? Don't you have any family? What's your name? The homeless man became thoughtful and then turned to her. Honestly, I don't even know. I only remember being in an abandoned house. Injured in my H. EAD and other parts. In severe pain. I don't even know how I got there. Nor do I remember what happened before. I don't even remember who I am. And no one seems to recognize me. I've been everywhere. Trying to find a job. But no one wants to hire me because I don't have any identification. When I went to the police station. They just told me. You're a drug addict. You're crazy. Get out of here. I got no answers. Nobody listens to me. Dina was shocked by his frankness. After he finished eating, she simply said to him, Oh, I'm sorry to hear what you've been through. Honestly, I don't know what to say. I really feel sorry for your current situation. Winter is coming. And I live close by. My husband left some coats. And I believe they would be useful to you. The homeless man couldn't believe that someone would show such concern for him. Yet he initially refused her offer. However, the woman was persistent. And eventually, the man shyly followed her to her house. Upon arrival, she asked him to wait outside while she fetched a bag full of coats. Even though she felt she could help him more, she noticed how unkempt and dirty his clothing was. Clearly neglected. Thus, she invited him to take a shower. Surprised by the trust this woman was placing in him, the homeless man said, Madam, I appreciate your generosity, but that's not necessary. He replied. Nevertheless, Dina insisted, saying it was no trouble at all and that she would be happy to let him shower at her place and put on fresh clothes. The man accepted her invitation again and entered her house. The woman provided him with soap, a towel, clothes to change into, and even scissors and a razor. The homeless man then went into the bathroom, while Dina prepared some food for him to take away. After a while, she heard the door open and couldn't believe her eyes. In front of her stood a clean, neat man, with a trimmed beard and combed hair, looking handsome. The man, who was once a homeless wanderer, 
now looked as if he had never suffered from hunger or homelessness. Wow! You look great! She said. Thank you. I've prepared some food for you. Would you like some? No. Madam. You've already done enough for me. The young man replied. Don't call me madam. Actually I'm married. But I will be getting a divorce soon. Dina said. I'm sorry. The wanderer responded. You don't need to be sorry. On the contrary. I'm glad he's no longer in my life. He was a bad person. Dina explained. I understand. He replied. But. Before he could take another step. He suddenly felt dizzy and almost collapsed. Are you okay? Dina asked. Yes. It happens sometimes. A sudden intense headache makes me feel very weak. I see. You better lie down on the couch and rest. You don't need to leave now. Dina suggested. So. The man fell asleep on the couch. Dina let him rest. But a few hours later. She noticed he seemed to be having a nightmare. So she went over to try to wake him. He was sweating profusely. Appearing to have a high fever. In a panic. Dina called a nurse friend who lived nearby. Minutes later. The nurse arrived. Where did this handsome man come from? Friend. It's a long story. I'll tell you later. I'm just not sure what's wrong with him. What's his name? The nurse asked. I don't know. Dina replied. He doesn't remember. Says he can't remember anything. Okay. I'll check on him. The nurse approached the young man. Greeted him. And asked about his symptoms. He told the nurse that he had a severe headache. The nurse gave him some painkillers and suggested he see a doctor. As the injury to his head might have caused serious trauma. The wanderer wanted to leave. But the nurse. With her. Told him it could be very dangerous without enough time. But I have no documents. How can they provide service to me? Don't worry. The first person said. I'll go to the hospital where I work. They'll take care of you. The young man said. Okay. And so he stayed overnight at Dina's place. The next morning. They went to the hospital where the doctors examined him and conducted some tests. The results of which would only be known after a few days. In the meantime. They gave him some painkillers and advised him to rest during these days. Dina insisted on letting the man stay at her house. Helping him. And she started to realize that she was growing more and more fond of him. And he was a very gentlemanly man. When she came home from work. He had already prepared meals. Even made breakfast for her. And tidied and cleaned the house. He said. This is the least I can do for you. You've helped me a lot. I never thought I would get help in this way. Thank you for everything you've done for me. In that moment. He hugged Dina tightly and even kissed her hand. The woman felt a sincere affection that she had missed for a long time. They even watched TV together. And Dina no longer felt lonely. Once. The wanderer asked her. Why did your husband leave? Actually. I'm embarrassed to talk about it. But I'll tell why. Oh you. He cheated on me in many situations. No matter how many times I forgave him. He remained the same. So I kicked him out of the house. It's just that I haven't divorced yet. It takes a lot of money to go through those procedures. And I'm still saving up. The man said. That's foolish. I would never leave a woman as kind and beautiful as you. The girl blushed. Finally. Two weeks passed. And they went to the hospital together for a diagnosis. Fortunately. He had no serious issues. But he needed to continue taking medication and undergo hypnotherapy to gradually recover his memory. Gradually. The man's headaches disappeared. One day. When the nurse visited Dina. She said. You know. I think he was never really a wanderer. Look at him. He looks good. A bit thin perhaps. But he looks like a model. Don't you think? Well. The young man said. He's become quite a sensation now. Have you told your parents about having another man in the house? Not yet. In fact. I myself don't know how to tell them. Currently. I enjoy helping him with his health. He's much better than before. He has recovered a lot in this short time. But he still doesn't remember anything. Oh. But surely one day he will remember. And for now. We call him the handsome guy. Then the two young women laughed. However. One day. 
When Dina came home from work with some cakes to share with the man, she was surprised to find a letter on the table. Dear Dina, you have no idea how much what you have done for me means. This morning, I finally remembered who I am. I could have waited to tell you, but I decided to write a letter to express my gratitude. I felt it was necessary. I took some money you left on the table. Believe me, I thought about it for a long time. I didn't want you to think I am a thief. I promise to pay you back. Yours, Boris. It was then that Dina learned his name, and a tear fell on the paper. She felt she might never see him again. Day after day passed, but nothing happened. Dina then called her friend, the nurse, to tell her what had happened. Her friend came to Dina's house, trying to comfort her. Don't worry, my friend, maybe he will come back. You fell in love with him, didn't you? Who wouldn't? He's so handsome. But cheer up. He'll return. However, just then, the nurse turned on the TV, and they heard a completely unexpected news. Hey, isn't that Boris? Look, he's dressed very formally, said the nurse. Dina could hardly believe it. Then they heard the reporter announce. After a year and a half of searching, entrepreneur Boris Smirnov has finally appeared. His family is overjoyed to have found him. But there's bad news. His wife and business partner have been jailed. It has been confirmed that his wife was having an affair with his best friend. And the two of them beat him and left him in an abandoned house. Thinking he was dead. However, the entrepreneur is now publicly revealing these horrific facts. The owner of the travel service company stated, I'm back. And there are many things that need to be clarified. Fortunately, my ex-wife has been jailed. And the person I once thought was my best friend has just been arrested. I won't rest until they pay for everything they did to me. They stole a lot of money from me. They conspired to make me disappear. To take over everything I've built so far. I won't allow this to happen. That's all I have to say. At that moment, Dina began to cry. Friend, why are you crying? The nurse asked. Don't you see? He's an entrepreneur. Do you think he'll come back to this neighborhood? He didn't even call or leave a message for me. But it doesn't matter anymore. I've been through worse. Hey, he'll come back. Said the nurse. Don't cry. Eventually. A week passed. And there was no other news from Paris. That day. When Dina was returning home from work. She found her ex-husband waiting for her outside. I saw you change the locks. Dear. Please forgive me. I was a fool and didn't realize what a good woman I had by my side. I hope you can forgive me. I still love you. I can't forget you. The man knelt down, grabbed her hand, and began to cry. Dina said, let go of me. I don't want to hear anything from you. In fact, I've already hired a lawyer to handle the divorce. And you better sign the papers when you receive them. But please, dear, you can't abandon me. I can. And now please leave. Dina replied. Her voice firm. Let go of me. Just then. They heard a man's voice gradually approaching. Let her go. Let her leave. The male voice said. Dina turned around. Surprised to find the handsome Boris getting out of a luxury car to see her. You better leave. You heard her. She doesn't want anything to do with you anymore. Boris said to the ex-husband. Then Dina walked towards Boris and threw herself into his arms. She cried for being able to see him again. Her tears filled with happiness. I'm sorry I left that way. My only wish was to resolve this issue. Now I can finally come to find you. I did. And call you before because I didn't know how to tell you. I'm ashamed of everything they did to me. Boris explained. But now you should know everything. Dear Dina. I never want to leave you again. Would you like to be with me? Would you be my girlfriend? Dina hugged him tighter. And they kissed each other deeply. This kiss left her ex-partner speechless. Of course. He had no choice but to leave. As causing a scene would only make things worse. This is how this wonderful story ends. With two souls meeting and reuniting for a lifetime of love. If Dina had never helped that homeless man. Those who hurt him would have succeeded. Moreover. This also proves that behind every bad partner, 
There is always a better person waiting for you. Don't you think? I hope this video has been helpful to you. If so, please don't hesitate to like, comment, and share. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.